a recurring challenge in mathematics that um, I call the dichotomy between structure and randomness. That most objects that you can generate in mathematics are random. Uh, they look like random, like the digits of pi. Well, we believe is a good example. Um, but there's a very small number of things that have patterns. Um, but um, now, you can prove something as a pattern by just constructing, you know, like if something has a simple pattern and you have a proof that it, it does something like repeat itself every so often, you can do that. But um, and you, you can prove that that for example, you can you can prove that most sequences of, of digits have no pattern. Um, so like if, if you just pick digits randomly, there's something called low large numbers. It tells you you're gonna get as many ones as, as twos in the long run. Um, but um, we have a lot fewer tools to 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 if I give you a specific pattern like the digits of pi, how can I show that this doesn't have some weird pattern to it. Some other work that I spend a lot of time on is to prove what are called structure theorems or inverse theorems that give tests for when something is, is very structured. So some functions are what's called additive. Like if you have a function that maps the natural numbers to the natural numbers. So, so maybe um, you know two maps to four, three maps to six, and so forth. Um, some functions are what's called, what's called additive, which means that if you add if you add two inputs together, the output gets gets added as well. Uh, for example, uh, multiplying by a constant. If you multiply a number by ten, um, if you if, if you multiply a plus b by ten, that's the same as multiplying a by ten and b by ten and then adding them together. So some um, functions are additive. Some functions are kind of additive, but not completely additive. Um, so, uh, for example, if I take a number n, I multiply by the square root of two, and I take the integer part of that. So 10 by square root of 2 is like 14 point something. So 10 up to 14. Um, 20 up to 28. Um, so in that case, additivity is true then. So 10 plus 10 is 20, and 14 plus 14 is 28. But because of this rounding, uh, sometimes there's round-off errors. And, and sometimes when you um, add a plus b, this function doesn't quite give you the sum of, of the two individual outputs, but the sum plus or minus 1. Um, so it's almost additive, but not quite additive. Um, so there's a lot of useful results in mathematics, and I've worked a lot on developing things like this, to the effect that if, if a function exhibits some structure like this, then um, it's basically, there's a reason for why it's true, and the reason is because there's, there's some other nearby function which is actually um, com completely structured, which is explaining this sort of partial pattern that you have. Um, and so if you have these sort of inverse theorems, it, um, it creates this sort of dichotomy that, that either the objects that you study are either have no structure at all, or they are somehow related to something that is structured, um, and in either way, in either um, uh, in either case, you can make progress. Um, a good example of this is that there's this old theorem in mathematics called Samaritan's theorem, uh, proven in the 1970s. It concerns trying to find a certain type of pattern in a set of numbers. And the, the pattern is arithmetic progression, things like three, five, and seven, or, or, or ten, fifteen, and twenty. And Samaritan, Andre Samaritan, proved that um, any set of, of numbers that is sufficiently big. Um, what's, called, what's called positive density, has um, arithmetic progressions in it of, of any length you wish. Um, so, for example, um, the odd numbers have a set of density one half, um, and they contain arithmetic progressions of any length. Um, so in that case, it's obvious because the, the, the odd numbers are really, really structured. I can just take uh, 11, 13, 15, 17, I can, just, I can, I can easily find arithmetic progressions in, in, in that set. Um, but um, the also applies to random sets. If, if I take the set of all numbers, and I flip a coin um, and I, uh, for each number, and I only keep the numbers which for which I got a heads. Okay, so I just flip coins, I just randomly take out half the numbers, I keep one half. So that's a set that has no, no patterns at all. But just from random fluctuations, you will still get a lot of, um, um, of arithmetic prog progressions in that set. Can you prove that there's arithmetic progressions of arbitrary length within a random... Yes. Um, have you heard of the infinite monkey theorem? Usually mathematicians give boring names to theorems, but occasionally yeah. they, they give colorful names. Yes. The popular version of the infinite monkey theorem is that if you have an infinite number of monkeys in a room with each of a typewriter, they type out uh, text randomly, almost surely one of them is going to generate the entire script of Hamlet or any other finite string of text. Uh, it will just take some time, uh, quite a lot of time, actually. But if you have an infinite number, then it happens. Um, so um, basically the theorem says that if you take an infinite string of of digits or whatever, um, eventually any finite pattern you wish will emerge. Uh, it may take a long time, but it will eventually happen. Um, in particular, arithmetic progressions of any length will eventually happen, Okay, but you, need that, you, but you need an extremely long random sequence for this to happen. I suppose that's intuitive. It's just infinity. Yeah, infinity absorbs a lot of sins. Yeah, how are we humans supposed to deal with infinity? 
Well, you can think of infinity as as just an abstraction of um, a finite number for which you d- you do not have a bound for. Um, that uh, you know, I mean, so nothing in real life is truly infinite. Um, but you know, you can um, you know, you can ask yourself questions like, you know, what if I had as much money as I wanted? You know, or what if I could go as fast as I wanted? And a way in which mathematicians formalize that is mathematics has found a formalism to idealize instead of something being extremely large or extremely small, to actually be exactly infinite or zero. Um, and often the, the mathematics becomes a, a lot cleaner when you do that. I mean, in, in physics, we, we joke about uh, assuming spherical cows. Um, you know, like, reward problems have got all kinds of reward effects, but you can idealize, send certain things to infinity, send some, certain things to zero. Um, and, um, and the mathematics becomes a lot simpler to work with there. I wonder how often using infinity... Uh, forces us to deviate from um, the physics of reality. Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of pitfalls. Um, so you know, we we spend a lot of time in you know, undergraduate math classes teaching analysis, um, and analysis is often about how to take limits and 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 whether you, you know. So for example, a plus b is always b plus a. Um, so when when you have a finite number of terms and you add them, you can swap them, and there's no, there's no problem. But when you have an infinite number of terms, there are these sort of shell games you can play where you can have a series which converges to one value, but you rearrange it, and it suddenly converges to another value. And so you can make mistakes. You have to know what you're doing when you allow infinity. Um, you have to introduce these epsilons and deltas, and, and, and there's, there's a certain type of way of reasoning that helps you avoid mistakes. Um, in re- more recent years, um, people have started taking results that are true in, in infinite limits and tra- what's, called, and what's called finitizing them. Um, so you know that something's true eventually, but um, you don't know when. Now give me a rate, okay? So such that if I have, don't have an infinite number of monkeys, but but a large finite number of monkeys, how long do I have to wait for Hamlet to come out? Um, and um, that's a more qual- quantitative question. Um, and this is something that you can you can um, attack by purely finite methods, and you can use your finite intuition. Um, and in, in this case, it turns out to be exponential in the length of the text that you're, you're trying to generate. Um, so, if, um, and so this is why you never see the monkeys create Hamlet. You can maybe see them create a four-letter word, but not, nothing that big. And so, I personally find once you finitize an infinite statement, it's, it does become much more intuitive, uh, and it's no longer so so weird. Um, so, even if you're working with infinity, it's good to finitize so that you can have some intuition. Yeah, the downside is that the finitized proofs are just much much messier, yeah. and and uh, yeah. So, the, so the infinite ones are found first usually, like decades earlier, uh, and then later on people finalize them. So since we mentioned a lot of math and a lot of physics, Mm -hmm. uh, what do you use the difference between mathematics and physics as disciplines, as ways of understanding, of seeing the world? Maybe we can throw an engineering in there. You mentioned your wife is an engineer, give a new perspective on circuits. Right. So this different way of looking at the world, given that you've done mathematical physics, so you've you've worn all the hats. Right, so... I think science in general is an interaction between three things. Um, there's the real world. Um, there's what we observe of the real world, our observations, and then our mental models as to how we think the world works. Um, so um, we can't directly access reality. Okay, uh, all we have are the are observations, which are incomplete and they they have errors. Um, and um, there are many many cases where we would. Um, uh, we want to know, for example, what is the weather like tomorrow, and we don't yet ha- have the observation, and we'd like to a, a prediction. Um, and then we have these simplified models, sometimes making unrealistic assumptions, you know, spherical cow type things. Those are the mathematical models. Mm-hmm. Mathematics is concerned with the models. Science collects the observations, and it proposes the models that might explain these observations. What mathematics does, it, uh, we, we stay within the model and we ask what are the consequences of that model, what observations would what predictions would the model make of the of future observations um, or past observations? Does, does it fit uh, observed data? Um, so there's definitely a symbiosis. Um, it's math. I guess mathematics is is unusual among other disciplines. Is that we start from hypotheses like the axioms of a model and ask what conclusions come out from that, that model. Um, in almost any other discipline, uh, you start with the conclusions. You know, I want to do this. I want to build a bridge. You know, I, I want to to make money. I want to do this. Okay, and then you 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 find the path to get there. Um, a lot there's there's a lot less sort of speculation about. You know, suppose I did this, what would happen? Um, you know, planning and and, and modeling. Um, 
speculative fiction maybe is, is one other place uh, but uh, that's about it actually most of the things we do in life is conclusions driven including physics and science you know, I mean they want to know you know where is this asteroid going to go you know what what's, what what is the weather going to be tomorrow um, but um, mathematics also has this other direction of, of going from the uh, the axioms what do you think there is this tension in physics between theory and experiment mm-hmm what do you think is a more powerful way of discovering truly novel ideas about reality? Well, you need both, top down and bottom up. Um, yeah, it's, just a, it's, it's a really interaction between all these things. So over time, the observations and the theory and the modeling should go, both get, get closer to reality. But initially, and it is, I mean, uh, this is um, this is always the case. You know, they're, they're always far apart to begin with. Um, but you need one to figure out where, where to push the other. You know, so. Um, if your model is predicting anomalies um, that are not picked up by experiment, that tells experimenters where to look, you know, um, to 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 find more data to refine the models. Um, you know, so it, it it goes it goes back and forth. Um, within mathematics itself, there's there's also a theory and experimental component. It's just that until very recently, theory has dominated almost completely. Like ninety nine percent of mathematics is theoretical mathematics, and there's a very tiny amount of experimental mathematics. Um, I mean, people do do it, you know, like if they want to study prime numbers or whatever, they can just generate large data sets. And with a com- so once we had a computers, um, we began to do it a little bit. Um, although even before, well, like Gauss, for example, he discovered, he conjectured the most basic theorem in, in number theory, which is called the prime number theorem, which predicts how many primes that up to a million, up to a trillion. It's not an obvious question. And basically what he did was that he computed, uh, I mean, mostly he um, by himself, but also hired human computers, um, people who, whose professional job it was to do arithmetic, um, to compute the first 100,000 primes or something, and made tables and made a prediction. Um, and that was an early example of experimental mathematics. Um, but until very recently, it was not... Um, yeah, I mean, theoretical mathematics was just much more successful. I mean, because doing complicated mathematical computations is, uh, was just not, not feasible. Uh, until very recently, uh, and even nowadays, you know, even now, though we have powerful computers, only some mathematical things can be um, explored numerically. There's something called the combinatorial explosion. If you want us to study, for example, Zermatt's theorem, you want to study all possible subsets of the numbers one to a thousand. There's only one thousand numbers. How bad could it be? It turns out the number of different subsets of one, of one to a thousand is two to the power one thousand, which is way bigger than than that any computer can currently can can enumerate. In fact, any computer ever or ever can um, enumerate. Um, so you have to, you have to be, um, there are certain math problems that very quickly become just in, intractable to attack by direct brute force computation. Uh, chess is another um, a famous example. Uh, the, the number of chess positions, uh, we can't get a computer to fully explore. But now we have AI. Um, um, we have tools to explore this space, not with 100% guarantees of success, but with experiment. You know, so like um, we can empirically solve chess now. Uh, for example, uh, we have we have a, a very very good AIs that, that can you know, they don't explore every single position in, in the game tree, but they have found some very good approximation. Um, and people are using actually these chess engines to, uh, to make uh, to do experimental chess. Um, that uh, they're, they're revisiting old chess theories about oh you know when you this type of opening you know this is a good, this is a good type of move this is not, and they can use these chess engines to actually uh, refine, uh, and in some cases overturn um, um, conventional wisdom about chess. 